Welcome back to another custom 3D printed PC case project. And I must say that this project is kind of special, because even though it can hold really long GPUs and some relatively tall CPU coolers, it can actually be printed on a really small printer. This is the biggest part in the case, and even on my Ender 3, this looks really small. That's because the required build volume for this case is actually as small as 180 by 180 millimeters meaning that you can even print this entire case on a super small printer like the Prusa Mini or the Bamboo A1 Mini. The case takes up a really small footprint on the desk and the plexiglass side panel allows you to enjoy those RGB lights for that ultimate gaming experience. The case supports the use of a Mini ITX motherboard, a 3-slot GPU up to 310mm in a normal configuration or 330mm if ditching the front intake fan. It uses a SFX power supply and can hold air coolers up to 144mm as well as a couple 2.5 inch hard drives. What's really cool about this case is that everything you see here can be printed. The case itself doesn't even require any screws. The majority of the parts are actually joined using 3D printed snap-in clamps, sliding pieces and locking pins. And the side panels are magnetic for easy access to the internal components. The hex pattern on the external panels are created within the slicing software by using no top or bottom layers and only infill and walls. But printing requirements vary a bit from part to part, therefore I've added detailed printing instructions to printables, explaining which panels need what settings. And don't worry, most parts are numbered so it's easy to keep track of what part is what. My case was printed on my newly purchased Creality K1 Max and I spent a total of 1.7 kilograms of filament for all the printed parts. So we start to build by grabbing the parts with the numbers 1, 2, 3 and 4. These panels are joined by using some 3D printed clamps that will snap into place. These four panels combined will make up the internal panel which is the core of the build and holds it all together. And this panel requires a total of 9 snap-in clamps. Next we can grab panel 5 and 6 and these have tracks embedded into them so they can slide onto the internal panel from the bottom and the top. Then we need to lock the two front panels together in the up and down direction. To do that we'll be using a piece that slides in between the two panels locking them both onto each other. The two panels also have a locking pin in the middle to prevent sideways movement in the sliding direction. So, when the sliding pin is inserted, the parts are now locked from moving in any direction. The sliding pin also uses a latching mechanism to prevent it from sliding back out. The joining pieces are also designed in a specific way. As they're all slightly different, they're all marked with two numbers, indicating which two panels this joining piece is intended to join, making it almost impossible to install it in the wrong place as long as you read the numbers. Now, you may notice that I really have to work the pieces in. And in this case, the tighter, the better. This is meant to be a permanent fit, so the tolerances are relatively tight. You can print most of the necessary body joints in one single print that fits within a 180 by 180 mm build plate. I know tolerances may vary from printer to printer, so at the time of making this video, I've added two different tolerances for these joints. 0.2 mm and 0.3 mm. But more options may be added later, if necessary. I've also created a simple tolerance test to check whether the 0.2 or the 0.3 tolerance fits your printer the best. The test uses the same joints as the actual build to get accurate results, but remember that the joints are intended to be really tight. Next we can grab panel 7 and 8. These are the two rear panels that have cutouts for the GPU and IO shield, and these are installed just like the front panels by sliding onto the internal panel. To join panels 7 and 8, we do just like we did on the two front panels, but here we have to use two joints due to the IO shield cutout. We have one long and one short joining piece. The bottom panels number 9 and 10 have some tracks that the internal panel drops into, aligning the holes. Into these holes we can insert these 3D printed locking pins, which can be gently pushed into place. Next we can slide in place our corner joints. These have a special shape that will lock the panels to each other, and these joints are identical on all four corners. If needed, use a screwdriver or something light to gently tap it into place. Just like the other panels, the bottom panels also have some teeth to prevent unwanted movement, which is then locked in place by sliding the joint marked with the numbers 9 and 10. Assembling the two top panels is the exact same as the bottom panels, by aligning the tracks with the holes 
pushing in the corner joints followed by the center joints and then the two locking pins through the holes. And simple as that, we now have a sturdy case chassis that's ready to hold some parts and we haven't even used a single screw yet. To mount our SFX power supply, we need to install these two brackets, marked SFX1 and SFX2. These brackets will slide into the tracks in the forward top panel and will latch onto the internal panel on both sides, so they'll stay in place. The SFX power supply can now be inserted into the mount from the side and be secured from the other side using two screws. Then we can tap into place our four motherboard standoffs, which will thread themselves directly into the plastic. Now, if you do not have standoffs available, you can also use M3 nuts and M3 by 20mm machine screws together with a 3D printed spacer that's included with the print files. It's now time to install our motherboard, and I've pre-installed my CPU cooler, but you can do this afterwards as well if you prefer that. The ITX motherboard simply drops onto the standoffs or spacers and can be secured into place. Now, let's talk about airflow. This case supports the use of either a 140 or a 120mm intake fan mounted to the front panel. And for aesthetic reasons I chose to go for this black fan I had laying around, to fit the dark theme of the build. The fan is mounted using regular fan screws to this bracket that also acts as a spacer between the front panel and the fan blades to reduce unwanted fan noise. The case also supports a 92mm exhaust fan that screws into place with regular fan screws directly onto the chassis. The power supply requires the use of an angled C13 cable due to limited clearance. You can either use a snap-in C14 connector like you see me use here, which will require some basic wiring skills, or you can simply feed a longer cable through the hole in the back and up to the power supply, leaving the cable hanging out the back of the case. If you're looking to have extra storage, this case can hold two 2.5 inch hard drives mounted hidden away behind the internal panel, and the smaller 2.5 inch drives use regular M3 threads, so you can easily mount these using some M3 by 10 mm screws. If you didn't already pre-install your CPU cooler, you can easily do this now as well, as you still have full access to the back of your CPU mount as well as the extra M.2 slot if your motherboard has that. The GPU is also super easy to install, just like in any other case it will simply click into place and can be secured from the outside. To secure the GPU into place we can either use a M3 screw with a nut or melt in place a M3 threaded insert. With all of our components installed, it's just a matter of adding all the power cables and these can be conveniently hidden away behind the motherboard by feeding them through the cutouts in the internal panel. We must also add our 12mm power button and plug that into our motherboard. To cover the opening next to the GPU mount, we have this bracket that will slide in place and it's intended to lock into place. Even though it doesn't fully lock into place in the video, the design has now been updated so this should lock into place. Then it's just a matter of tidying up the cables with some zip ties and we are ready to make our side panels. The side panels consist of four pieces that are joined using 3D printed snap-in pieces that will lock into place. We need one snap-in joint for each side as well as the center joint. The two side panels are actually swappable, meaning that if you do not want a transparent glass panel on the other side, you can actually make two copies of this panel. Next, we can push in place some 8 by 3 mm neodymium magnets. And these magnets may or may not require a tiny amount of glue to stay in place, depending on your tolerances. We can then place another magnet on top of the magnets we already installed and mark each magnet with a black sharpie. This way we know what direction the magnet should be facing down into the hole on the opposite part to ensure that our magnets will stick together instead of rejecting each other. We can now align the parts and then take the magnets one by one and insert them into the corresponding hole on the main body. When all the magnets are installed we can align the four pins at the bottom of the side panel with the four matching holes in the main body and tilt our side panel into place so it locks onto the magnets. For the opposite side panel, which is the panel that will hold the plexiglass, we have four L-shaped pieces that are joined using almost the same type of snapping joints like the other panel, but three of these pieces have an extra little edge that is there to hold our plexiglass in place. These joints simply snap into place like on the other side and lock with the little latching piece so that we get this frame. We can then grab our 2mm thick plexiglass, which should be cut down to 219 by 319 mm The glass can simply slide under the little edge on the snap-in joints on the sides and the bottom. 
The top joint between panel 15 and 16 should not have this little edge. The top should then be secured in place with some hot glue or other glue of your choice. I also recommend adding glue to any areas where the glass feels loose from the frame. We can then install our magnets just like on the other side panel by inserting them into one side then adding magnets on top, marking the outside with a sharpie and pushing them into place on the opposite panel. We can then test fit the panel to make sure it works as intended. One flaw I noticed after adding the panel was that nothing was holding it in place in the middle at the joint, so it had a tendency to bulge out a bit. To fix this I added another two magnet mounts to each side of both panels to make sure that the middle would stay flush with the body. To elevate the case a bit from the surface we can slide into place some feet. The four feet simply slide into the tracks embedded into the underside of the case. And now we have room for air to pass through to the underside of the GPU intake. The side panels can then be put back into place and the build is complete. I started this project with no specific goal in mind other than to make it printable on the Prusa Mini and A1 Mini, because I had received quite a few comments from people saying that their printers weren't big enough for most of my previous builds. But I'm super happy with how it turned out and the small footprint it takes up on my desk. And performance wise it's just about what you'd expect from a case this size. When running a Cinebench stress test on my i5-10400 it maxed out at 71 degrees while using the Cooler Master Hyper TX3 CPU cooler. The graphics card installed in this case is a blower style card and these generally run a lot hotter than most normal graphics cards so it won't really give a realistic reading of how well the case performs in terms of GPU temperatures as this card always reaches 80 plus degrees no matter what case I put it into. If you found this project interesting, you're welcome to check out my printables link in the video description, where you'll find detailed printing instructions and more. The print files are available to download for my Printables Club members. Consider becoming a member to support my work and to gain access to all my exclusive models and upcoming project models. You'll also get access to my Discord server, where you'll get project updates and project help if needed. As always, feel free to post suggestions for upcoming projects in the comments down below. If you enjoyed watching this build, please consider leaving a like on this video as it helps YouTube recommend this video to more people. And also consider subscribing to my channel so you do not miss out on my upcoming projects. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again in my next video.